I'm Barry Weiss, and this is Honestly. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists stormed into the home of Hadar and Itai Berdachevsky in Kibbutz Kfar Aza, one of the communities alongside the Gaza border. Hadar and Itai, both 30 years old, a couple that had been together for a decade, were two of the people killed that morning by Hamas, butchered in their own home. Miraculously, their 10-month-old twin boys survived. They were found, rescued by the IDF 14 hours later, crying in their cribs. Their parents' bodies lay in pools of blood beside them. Today I'm talking with the twins' aunt and uncle, Maya and Devere Rosenfeld, who themselves also survived the massacre on Kibbutz Kfar Aza that day. They hid in a safe room for more than 24 hours with no electricity, with their own baby boy, holding their hands over his mouth to make sure they wouldn't be found. Meanwhile, hearing the terrible sounds of their neighborhood being turned into a slaughterhouse around them. Now Maya and Devere are helping raise their orphan twin nephews. I met Maya and Devere because they traveled from Israel to L.A. last week. Now why, you might ask, are two people who just lost their family members to terrorists, who survived that terrorist attack themselves, and who have been, as they put it, refugees in their own country, flying to L.A. after that horrific and traumatic experience. As Maya and Devere told me, they came here because they heard that people either don't know, don't care, or don't believe what happened on that day. And that, in their mind, simply cannot stand, especially as 130 people, some of them members of their kibbutz, are still held by Hamas in Gaza. And so in the midst of mourning the loss of their family, in the midst of trying to help the rest of their family recover from this tragedy, they felt compelled to get on a plane to travel around the world to share their story, and to share the story of Itai and Hadar and their orphan twins to wake the world up to understand what is happening right now to the people of Israel. There are so many stories from October 7th that need to be told. We've told many of them on Honestly, and still we've barely scratched the surface of what happened that day, of the thousands upon thousands of stories, individual human stories, each one deserving to be shared with the world. But we wanted to tell this one today because of the little light that can still be found amidst the unimaginable darkness. Because those two twins represent the senseless tragedy and unbelievable bravery of what's happened since October. They represent the ultimate despair and also the miracles. They represent both death and life. Stay with us. Maya and Tvir, thank you so much for coming on Honestly. First of all, tell me a little bit about where you live and why you're here in L.A. right now. First, thank you for having us. I'm Tvir, I'm 40 years old, and uh, Maya, 39 years old, and we have Ziv, our son, with us here, which is uh, one years old. We are from Kfaraza. I was born and raised in Kfaraza. Uh, we are a family of six brothers and sisters. We were all born and raised in the kibbutz. Kibbutz is a, a small community. How uh, many people? How many a, families? Around uh, 900 people. Uh, and everyone are, grew up with everyone. And everyone knows everyone. How uh, did your family wind up living? Um, so, so many people who will look at the map right now, they're going to think to themselves, why would anyone choose to live there? So right? F- why would anyone choose to live so close to Gaza? Tell me about how your family really wound up in Israel, but wound up living there. So first, my parents arrived there when they were around their 20s. Um, back then, it was paradise. Like, there was no border, barely a fence. They used to do their shopping in, in Gaza. When I, when, I was a wow. kid, when I was a kid, we used to go to Gaza. And what was it like back then? It was paradise. Their beach was amazing. We were we used to work the fields and just next to them. And the Jewish holidays, they used to come, like the workers from, from Gaza that used to work in, in Faraza, they used to come to our holidays. And the Muslim holidays, we used to go there. And, you know, we, we uh, till this day, by the way, people are still talking, you know, every time that there's something between 
uh, between uh, them and us. Like people are ringing to each other to make sure that everyone are okay. We used to fix our cars there and get our furniture and um, buy the bicycles. And so you would swim at the beach in Gaza growing up. Back then, yeah. Now, Maya, you didn't grow up in Kfar Aza, did you? I didn't grow up there. I moved there about two and a half years ago, a very short time after we started dating. Actually, the first time I went to visit Vir, when we just started dating, right away I knew this is going to be my house. I fell in love with the kibbutz. I really loved the place. It was paradise. I used to live in Tel Aviv before, so all my friends, they told me, are you crazy? What are you going to go and live there? But every time, like, we, we invited them over, and when they came and they saw the kibbutz, they all straight away understand because it was just a beautiful place. We used to call it, everybody used to call it 95% paradise and 5% hell because it was paradise when everything was okay. Everything is green, there's lawns and grass and flowers and everything is very family-oriented, uh, kids-oriented. But then when there's an escalation, when the, uh, when the Hamas or the terror organization starts to shoot rockets, that's hell. So that's the 5% hell. Usually most of the people just leave their homes for a few days, go up north, they stay over at friends or at hotels, just wait until things come down and then come back. But it was really paradise. It was the most beautiful place in Israel, I think. One of the things that, that struck me the more I was reading about Kfar Aza is how really peace-loving this community is. You know, you could look at some of the images that came out after October 7th, and there were literally Peace Now, Shalom Achshav stickers in some of the windows. Tell us about the worldview of the people that chose to live in Kfar Aza. You, you, I think you can tell the story uh, with, one, with one thing. Ironically, on October 7th, we're supposed to be something that's called a Fifoniada, uh, like a kite festival that uh, was organized by the Kutz family. The whole message of the Fufiniada was they will throw rockets at us. We will throw uh, kites in order to show them that we want peace, that we want uh, to be uh, in good relationship with one, and I want them to see that. Now, the Kutz family, a family of five, was murdered on that day, uh, on the October 7. And again, they were the organizers of this uh, festival, which was supposed to take place on October 7. A lot of the people in our kibbutz and also in all the environment, in all the area, used to organize transportation for people from Gaza who came into Israel to get medicine, to get uh, medical treatments, to get surgeries. You know, Israel used to let in people from Gaza for them to get uh, uh, their uh, the treatments that they need. They used to go to the border to, to take them, bring them to wherever they need, and then take them back because otherwise... They either walk or wait for buses or who and knows what. I think even us, every in every escalation round, we used to talk about it and we used to say that we didn't feel sorry for ourselves. Even though we weren't in our homes, we, we moved from our, from our home and it wasn't so comfortable for us. We were, we were feeling so sorry for the people in Gaza, for the kids, for the families, for the civilians who are not involved. And, and we know that they're firing rockets right from the middle of schools, like just out of... The from their gardens, their balconies, and they, they don't have anything to do about it. We just felt They will sorry say no, they will... Be killed. Be killed. So, Dvir, you're, you're part of this family. There's six kids, but it's not a religious family. No. Right? So for most Americans, they think six kids, they're going to think, like, they must be Mormon or religious religious in some way. But you have six kids in your family, four girls, two boys. Tell me a little bit about your sister, Hadar. Um, Hadar, she's the youngest of the four sisters. Smart, sharp, beautiful. When you say you know, someone that he's... Um, is is perfect like inside and out this is this is this is Adar. everything she touched became gold she couldn't do half a job in whatever she whatever she did studying friends wise kids wise uh, brother family wise always smiling uh, such a good soul which also Make make you hard to believe that when the terrorists 
cross through the, through her house they thought she's she's a threat to them you know it's it's not that I don't know like it's a man and they think that he's they have weapon or is a, is a danger to them or she was the most delicate thing beautiful skinny tall woman no one can can be mistaken to think she's she's a threat tell me about her husband Itai there must be something magnetic about this family that you draws people from places like Tel Aviv to go move to Kfar Azaz. Tell me about Itai. Itai. Itai became a family in a matter of minutes. Seriously, such a good guy. He loved her so much. Um, buff, big guy, but so gentle, so, so good. Uh, always helps, always laugh, always, um, always, he's always there for you. No matter what amazing husband amazing friend um, unbelievable father how did they meet each other through a common friend um, that basically grabbed them both and told them <laughs> you need to you need to get to know each other and it was the perfect combination so you guys have a baby that's one year old they have children that are 10 months old like you What was the baby boom like? And so you're all having kids. At, how many of the siblings had kids sort of at the same time? So uh, out of the six brothers and sisters, four of us lived in the kibbutz. Wow. Uh, the four married uh, with kids, brothers, sister, three sisters and, and myself. Um, and the two bachelors lived in Tel Aviv. The baby boom, I think uh, it's the... Uh, We had... The fir- firsthand uh, <laughs> We had testimony. The, <laughs> five babies in one year. In the five same, babies in yeah, the same family. Five babies in, in the same in family. In seven months. In seven months, actually. All of the kibbutz used to like, uh, laugh that we're, uh, it's, here's the Rosenfeld clan, like uh, you're taking over the kindergarten. <laughs> like, we're, it was a power. Uh, yeah. M- Maya was pregnant uh, together with my three sisters. We actually we were All four of them mater- were, pre- were pregnant together. And we were on maternity leave together. So it was also a lot of fun. It was very helpful, of course. We had so many dreams to grow them. Like we always used to talk about it, that it's going to be so fun to grow them up together. That, you know, you used to, we used to look at them together and say, these five are going to be together and grow, up, grow older together, their whole lives together. You know, we had so many dreams. <laughs> so many plans. Let's go to October 7th, okay? Let's start in the morning of that day. As you said, Maya, before, 95% of living there was heaven, 5% was hell. Take me back to that morning and how you started to know that something was amiss. Okay, so on October 7th, <laughs> uh, Ziv, Ziv didn't sleep so well uh, that night. He's not a good sleeper. So I was up almost all night with him and he was in bed with us and I was tired. And then like, at, I think around six, I didn't know it was six back then. He woke up and I was angry. I told him, why? I'm, I'm always the one waking up. Why don't you wake up? So the same fight in every couple. Of yeah. course. So Dvir was like, okay, I'm going to take him for a walk. And he started, he got dressed already. He got Ziv organized and they were going to go out. And I thought it was much 6, earlier. 6.15, I was on the way out with, yeah. with him. Okay. I thought it was much earlier. So I told him, what are you crazy? It's too early. Go back to sleep. He needs to sleep. And they went back to bed. And within, I think, 10 minutes, around 6.25, 6.30, we heard really loud sounds of explosions. There was no uh, red alert uh, um, siren. siren at that yet. There were really heavy explosions. What did you think it was when you first heard it? No, we knew, we knew it's the rockets. We but, thought it's, uh, we thought it's, it's just... It's crazy to say that it's, this is kind of our routine in, in our area. In our area, in the past 22 plus years, we have this routine that comes and goes, you know, uh, depends on how hot is the... Mm-hmm. Uh, our relationship with them but usually it's like either a few either a few dozens or a few hundred stops rockets in the in several days yeah um, once a year twice a year once in two years it, it comes and goes but the amount in this morning was something else so, so what did you do 
So at the beginning, we just thought it's just like another escalation that's starting. So we went straight away to our safe room. And every home on the kibbutz has a safe yes, room. Yes, every home within a radius of less than seven kilometers in uh, Gaza has a safe room from the government, which is just another, or, like you need to understand, it's not something underground, it's not any, it's just it's another room. It's not prepared as a safe room or a shelter room. It's okay? just it's another room. It's not like with uh, uh, water and food and power banks and stuff like that. It's just another room in the house. And usually the kids sleep there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it was our baby's room, just like the walls are made of cement. There's a special window, a special door. So we went to the safe room. We called some friends that living up north. We told them, listen, uh, th- we think there's an escalation starting. W- once it comes down, like, right now they're bombing, because usually they're bombed for like a few minutes, and then it's calmer, and then you can leave. So we said we're going to wait for it to come down, and then we're going to come up north. Co- come up north. But then it didn't stop. There were more and more and more and more missiles. And immediately Dvir told me, because I'm not so custom with that uh, yet, but Dvir immediately said, well, this is different. I've never heard anything like that. Now we know that they fired over 2,000 rockets that day. That actually was the distraction because that's what put everyone in the safe rooms, also in the army bases. And then they went and they slaughtered all the soldiers in the army bases that were in the safe rooms. Uh, so it didn't stop and it didn't stop and it didn't stop. But all you know is you're in the safe room with your son. You've never heard this many explosions. What was the communication like that morning with your with Hadar and your other family members and, and just the, the community of the kibbutz? I assume like everything in Israel, there's a WhatsApp group. Yeah. There are many it, WhatsApp it, groups. Many WhatsApp groups, yeah. So I, I, I even went out to bring the dogs. No, like no one thought this is what's going to happen. And I went out to bring the dogs. One of them w- was unleashed. The other one, because of the explosions, ran away. I went out to call him. Um, two weeks later, three weeks later, we realized that in the same place I stood to call him, half, half a minute later, my neighbor told me that half a minute later after he saw me standing there, there was five terrorists in our garden. Just and standing when, there. When half I, a minute later. Yeah. yeah. And when I went in, because I said, okay, you, you will come back. So I left the door open. For the dog. For the dog, when he come back, so he can get in. And went inside to help Maya to pack the bags. And straight away, the electricity fell, stopped. Um, so imagine that you're in this tiny room with no aircon, no lights. It was a um, hot day, very humid, No very air, hot day. no food, no water, and... Um, no bathroom. Nothing. And your baby. And our baby. And our baby. No um, food. And he started to hear, to get the, uh, these WhatsApp messages. What did the messages say? Um, At the beginning, I got WhatsApp, WhatsApp messages from, like, there's a group of uh, friends that they started to write, hey, we, we can hear gunshots. We can, we're starting to hear Arabic. So I told that to Dvir, and Dvir said, no, no, don't pay attention. People are exaggerating. But then after a few minutes, we started to hear Arabic and gunshots, which are not sounds that you're... That you're you ever thought you're going to hear. Also, you need to know there was the obstacle, like a very sophisticated uh, defense mechanism that Israel has put lots of money on it. So there was a promise that, don't worry, no one can penetrate to Israel from Gaza. So we didn't even imagine this thing can happen. We now know that something like 3,000 terrorists got over the border that day. Do you have any sense of how many were on your kibbutz specifically? Yeah. How many? From what uh, Zaka told us, Zaka is the the organization that deal with the you know identified the bodies and collect them. And they told us that uh, they collected only in for us only in our kibbutz, they collected two hundred and fifty two bodies of terrorists. Just in your kibbutz. Just and in our just kibbutz. Just dead terrorists. And we this know, is the dead, the bodies. We know that lots of them, like the ones who kidnap people. We saw a movie of like seven uh, terrorists kidnapping one woman. So there. And in our kibbutz, there were 18 people kidnapped. So there were so many more terrorists inside. Also, you had the looters, the ones that came in to, 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 to loot, to steal, to burn, to just make damage however way they can. So we believe there were hundreds in our kibbutz. Like so let, let's somewhere, somewhere between three to four hundred, according to what they say. So you're in the room, and basically it sounds like pretty soon after you're in the room, you're hearing the gunshots in the Arabic, and 
you're realizing that what people are texting you are not exaggerations because you're hearing them yourselves. Yeah. Where does your mind go? Um, from some reason, um, this is not, it's not something that you plan. It, but now, uh, now we realize that you get into, um, on kind of a thematic mode mm -hmm. because you know, you have your baby and this is your first concern. You have, you know, you have your friends and family. So this is your second concern. And from some reason, we trusted each other so much that we didn't even talk about anything during these 30 hours. Like, I held the door for, for 20 hours straight, and Maya uh, held Ziv for 20 hours, 20 some hours, dummy in the mouth, just like in the Holocaust, dummy in his mouth, a hand on his mouth, so he won't make any noises, won't cry. Um, during that, each one of us trying to to text or get information uh, you know, from, from, from friends, from family, to check out uh, who's where and that everything is all right. Um, so you're on automatic mode. And it happened to us in, in um, during the whole time we were there. Yeah. We didn't even talk. We didn't even plan anything. It just... Each one of us knew exactly what we need to do. And the first thing is to keep Ziv safe. How did you keep... I, I've thought about the nightmare of that day a lot with having a baby myself. How did you keep him quiet? And were you aware that him making noise could draw the terrorists into your home? We or knew, did that not... No, no, no. We knew... The first thing, you need to understand that our house... They didn't go get into our house, but our house was right in the middle of a battlefield. Things were exploding on our on our safe room uh, wall all the time. Uh, gunshots were just ten, 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 ten. It didn't stop. The bombing, the shooting didn't stop the whole time. So we knew that they were right outside. We thought like from the en the entrance to our house is on the back. So we thought, okay, we're safe. No one will come in our house because they will find it hard to find our house. We didn't know back then that we actually had terrorists in our yard, but we we knew we we're safe. We thought we we're safe from there. We were worried about the wall because we could hear them outside all the time. So we knew we have to be very quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also hear the bullets on the metal window yeah. of the safe room mm -hmm. constantly. So we knew we, were, we, we, we knew we had to keep very quiet. We knew we had to keep Ziv very quiet. And I also think he was in shock. Like he understood what's going on. Mm. He saw us, obviously. We were functioning, we were very, very on a survival mode, but I think we were scared for our lives, we were terrified. We, we, didn't, we didn't talk about it, but fear was obviously uh, very there. Uh, and I think he saw it and he was also pretty much quiet. He didn't make a lot of noise the whole time. Hmm. There were some times he started screaming or started doing th some things and then either we just telling him, like in Hebrew, shake it, shake it, you know, just begged him, quiet, quiet, or just put my hand on his mouth, just to keep, if, you just had to keep him quiet, there's nothing, he, he needs to be quiet, because we knew if he's going to make a noise, that's it, we're done. I think at the beginning, we didn't really understand how bad things were, we were still like, we said, okay, maybe there's a few terrorists in the kibbutz, they're going to get over it real soon, we have like a picture smiling in the safe room all together, we tried, we, also, like, people we, started we, texting us the whole we like, read the We read the, the messages. We heard the noises. But I, I, today I know that what we thought back then and what we saw when the soldiers uh, finally uh, um, took us out are two different things. Tell me about Hadar and Itai, because you're there in your safe room with a baby. And they're there in their safe room on the same kibbutz with two babies. When did you realize that they were in graver danger than you were? So um, the last message we, in our family WhatsApp group, the last message from Adal was at uh, five minutes to seven. And she wrote... Uh, such a great time to be stuck uh, in the in the shelter room with uh, two diapers or something like that, and everyone were laughing because again, no one thought this is what going to happen. So, like I went out to call the dogs, she went out to make bottles. 
for the twins. Later on, we, we understood that this is where they found her body on the kitchen's floor with two bottles in her hand. Um, so we kept texting each other the, between the whole family, but for some reason, Adar, Adar and Itai um, didn't answer. And somewhere around noon, like. we got this message from her neighbor, which um, was uh, one of the 12 people, 12 civilians from the kibbutz that were in the first, um, first respond team. And him and another one were the only two people that, st that stayed um, on their feet. Um, a lot of them got murdered. Some of them... Trying to protect the kibbutz. Yes. Yeah. Some of them uh, were injured, uh, got shot. And only these two are stayed on their feet. But once they realized that it's two against three, four hundred, they just went out, uh, went back to their homes to check on their families. So uh, he's my, he's a dad's neighbor. And neighbor. What, what did he send? And he you? sent uh, this message that said um, their door is open. There is an empty uh, magazine of AK-47, Kalachnikov. On the steps. On the steps, on the stairs. And I hear the twins cry. So when he texted you that at noon, we, did we, you know we, they we, were gone? We, we, we thought or told ourselves these stories probably to make sure that, you know, not to think of, of the worst news we could, we, could, we, could, we could get. But we didn't, you can't, like, we didn't uh, go there. We yeah. didn't say the exact words. We didn't, like, you don't use the exact words, but we said we were very worried. But then again, you're very in your own uh, survival mode that you need, like, he needs to hold the door, I need to hold Ziv. You don't have time for anything. You don't have time to be afraid. You don't have time to worry. You just focus on... And you can't on, show it to Ziv. You can't let him yeah. feel the... I, I looked at my WhatsApp messages after, and I said, like, there was such a big difference between what we spoke to each other and what I wrote to other people. Because hmm. to people outside, I wrote, we're very, we're very, very afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. Like, at the beginning, we still thought it's not so serious. But after a while, it started to look different. Like, we started, after a while, we started to hear, at the beginning, we just heard automatic weapon and Arabic and stuff. But then we heard and the hand, tank. Hand grenades. Yeah. But then rocket. we heard the tank. And soldiers, so we said, okay, so now the tank is here, the soldiers are here, so we're safe. So then there's 10 minutes of quiet, but then again, automatic weapon in Arabic. And this goes again and again and again and again. And I think at that point we understood, okay, we're occupied. We're not in Israel anymore. This is something different. The army mm -hmm. isn't getting, uh, isn't taking control and we're stuck here. So I think they're like mm. in the room, we try to stay very strong, very, you know, very focused, but to the outside world, it was different, the, the things we wrote. But I think like until until the neighbor, uh, until we heard what happened from the neighbor, we still had like a, 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 a room for hope. Like we may, we thought maybe they're just injured. Maybe, no, Dvir said maybe they fell asleep. You know, again, we yeah. told ourselves so many stories not not to deal with the, the what we what we felt. You're in denial. Because in, in, the back in, of, in the back of my head, I have to say, and I didn't have this message between two messages between me and my father that no one said the, 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 the words, but we felt it. And what was have, the message you have, to your father? To, um, I think the message is um, it doesn't feel good with the Bardicheski family. Hmm. And uh, I reply, I think you're right. Mm. Um, and during that time, you're still getting these messages from from uh, my friends' wives or, or for other other people. Uh, he got shot. He needs help. Uh, we, we, they're burning me alive. They're burning uh, they, me alive. They killed my parents. You got these messages yeah, on yeah. your phone while you're in the room. Yeah. We got these messages and like someone wrote, they killed my parents. Someone wrote, they shot this and that on her head and she's dying in front of her kids. Someone wrote, my husband is dying outside. Somebody needs to, she, he needs a, like a, 
How do you call a it? A tourniquet. Yeah. yeah. Someone needs to go and help him. He's wounded. And we're, we're reading that and we're saying, you know, your brain can't handle with all this information. You to- so you're just in denial. We say, why are they exaggerating? We'll go, help is coming. Stop exaggerating. Like, you don't need to exaggerate in order. We, we couldn't realize that this is really happening. And you have to understand that when when you get this message of, of please, he's dying, this is someone you grew up with and is. 50 to 100 meters from your home. Or you get these messages of they're burning me alive. It's like three houses away from you. The kibbutz is tiny. We couldn't go save our friends. They were stuck 50 meters from our home. My sister, Adai and Itai, there are three minutes walk from my house. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't do anything. We were there, we were there stuck holding the, 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 the handle. She's holding the, the, the baby. Um, but also the kibbutz ima- is full ima- of ima- ima- Imagine the, the, those 12 brave people that were this first response team. They left their families, they left their wives, they left their kids, and went out to fight for the kibbutz. 12 and people against 12 hundreds. 12 people against hundreds. Maya, I want to go back to one thing you said before we get back to Hadar and Itai. You said, we realized we were occupied, that this wasn't Israel anymore. One of the promises that Israel makes to its citizens, but especially to the people that live in the so-called Gaza envelope, is that you're going to be protected. I understand that in those moments, perhaps you were just completely focused on keeping the baby quiet and holding the door, and so maybe your mind didn't even go there. But I I guess I'm curious if it did to the thought of, hold on, we're supposed to have the most sophisticated army in the world. How is it that we're in our community, there are hundreds of terrorists occupying it? You said it's not Israel anymore. First thing I want to say, I I will answer your question. I want to, it's a very hard question. Well, the, the answer is hard. First thing I want to say, I'm full of appreciation to all the soldiers that lost their lives, and risked the, their and lives, the civilians. and the civilians that were fighting to try to save us and that saved us. This is the most important thing I want to say. But yes, you're right. At the whole time, we were texting um, friends we have from the idea, from the special forces, with our location, with Hadar's lo- like after we found out that the twins are crying, we texted them their location and said, listen, there's two babies there. You need to go there. And we asked them, like, I have friends from the special forces. I told them, where's the army? How can this be happening? We're here for a few hours already. When are you coming to get us? Don't you understand? We can't stay here. My house is a battlefield. I'm here with a baby. Why aren't you coming yet? And the, the response was, the situation is very complicated. We're trying to. We can't. We, 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 we can't. We just we can't get there. Um, I have actually one friend, my a very close friend of mine, husband, who was trying, he was running towards our house, but he, he told me I had to choose between coming to you or going to a house with terrorists inside or coming to a house with, to when they're burning the house on the people living we, we there. We didn't have electricity. We didn't watch TV. We didn't see the news. So a lot of the things that people are either wrote us, told us, asking us are things that at that point, we didn't know, we didn't see. Mm-hmm. I think the hardest point, like to, mm-hmm. we had two breaking points at that whole time in the safe room. But the first breaking point was around noon or afternoon when I asked my friend, when are you coming? Why, are, was, why, isn't, why aren't you taking us out of here? First thing you need to take us out of here. And then he told me, listen, it's going to take a while. I'm not sure they're going to get you out today. I think they're going to get you out only tomorrow. But if it's going to happen today, it will only be at night time. And this is after 10 hours. And this is after 10 hours. There. And then I looked at Vir. I told him, we're not staying here. We're going. We can't stay here at night. If we're staying, there's no electricity. There's no light outside. When, when it's going to get dark, that's it. It's a death sentence to us. Like whoever wants can go wherever they want. No one will see them. What, what are we going to do? We need, I, I really wanted to run away. Luckily, Dvir stopped me and he said, no, we're not going anywhere. It's too j- dangerous. But it, it felt like it was heartbreaking. Uh, not to, like, yeah, we trusted. We trusted our army. We trusted our country. And unfortunately, 
it didn't happen. We were left in our safe room for 24 hours, in the kibbutz for 30 hours uh, with our baby. So at what time, so you, you start, your family WhatsApp group, you start getting a sense, it's been two hours, it's been three hours, it's been four hours. We're not hearing from the Berdachevsky family. Even though they're a three-minute walk from you, you're not hearing from them. When did you start to get information about your sister and about her husband and about the babies? So we got, first we got the message from their neighbor, all right, around 12. 12 saying, five, saying, I hear the baby's say, crying. Saying that the, the door is open, there is an empty magazine on the stairs, and I hear the twins cry. Then I think another at least two or three cases during the time afterwards, we got another messages from people that says, we hear babies crying. But then around 8, 8.30, we got this phone call from Maya's friend, which is in the Special Forces, that said the twins are rescued. They're out. They're healthy. They're alive. They're out. And we asked them, what about Adar and Itai? And his answer was, they're not on the kidnapped list. He's like, okay, what, what, what are you not telling me? That's it. No, we didn't say anything. I think that after, I don't know, like 15 Very minutes, quickly. So around the 15 minutes, uh, my brother rang me. My brother lives, lives in Tel Aviv. And he very quickly realized that he can't help because he's far away. So he just opened in his living room in Tel Aviv kind of operation room, mm -hmm. connected to all the forces in, the, in Fraza and connected the, WhatsApp, the group. WhatsApp groups of the kibbutz, all the groups to the soldiers, including the locations of the houses and what happened. He was like what, the what is happening in each in each location between the civilians and the army. So he who's dead, who's injured, yeah, who's like, who needs where. So he rang me and told me, "I'm sorry, but uh, they are not with us anymore." This was the day breaking point, and again because we were in the, this automatic survival mode. I think it was a minute or two that right. we sat there and cried and but then pick we went out of it and started to take care of like you can't give up like we have Ziv with us and also so, and, now, and know, also we need first now there's two to babies you need to take care to, of to know so. to know to know to discover where they were in which hospital to which hospital they took them and but, second, but, uh, tell me that exp and it's so hard for someone that's never been in an experience like that to understand. You get information that your sister and her husband have been murdered. You cry for two minutes, and then what happens in your brain to to stop that? You, you think we, you need we, to take care of two babies? We like, have our okay. baby, and we have another two babies to take care of, and this is what you need to do. Immediately, it's, big, it's bigger than you. Immediately we started, like, all together started to figure out where it was such a chaos that nobody knew which hospital they took them. So we had to find out which hospital they're at. And then we had to find, because Phil's uh, younger brother and sister are bachelors. So they don't have a car seat, obviously. So let's organize two car seats. We told them straight. First, start going south. Yeah. Start going south. Both of you, start going south. We, we'll take care of where they, where, what you need to pick up from where. We will we'll arrange the list of what you need to buy on the way, but start going south. We made, we made them a list of exactly what they need to buy, like the formula, the diapers, the, the dummies, everything that they're using. And then again, we went back to the survival mode because you're still right in the middle of the situation. It's not over. So we now know that Hadar was killed by terrorists when she went out to get to make bottles for her two children. Yeah. What ended up happening to Itai? So probably like Adar's kitchen, this it's like the window in there in her kitchen is right. It's it's facing the to the um, like street. street. So probably this this neighborhood was one of the first neighborhoods that got hit before people even read or knew that uh, they they are in the kibbutz or, or you know shooting people, kidnapping people, burning people alive. Uh, so probably they saw her because she was making the bottles in the kitchen. And we know that they shot her through the window. 
uh, got into the house, um, verified, you know, the shot in her head. And then Itai, after he saw what happened, he closed the door behind him. He was with in the, the safe room. With the twins in the, in the safe room. So, so, he, he, so he saw his wife dead in, on the kitchen floor. Yeah. And closed straight away the, the door on him and the twins in inside the, the, the safe room. Okay, this is what we understand that yeah. happened, of mm-hmm. course. But uh, you see that there's bullet holes on the safe room door. So we can only imagine that he closed, he closed the door it. and he was you inside see, you, with the you babies. You see three bullet holes that got through the door. And two of them hit Hitai. And the third one hit one of the baby's beds. But then you see another... In the, inside the safe room, you see only one bullet hole in the floor. What does well, that mean? It means that they confirm Itai's death as well, next, right next to the twins. So you're saying while that the twin, not, not while all... the twins were in the bed. Luckily, so, Itai was smart enough to put both of them in the same bed, and which is not in the fire and, and which is not in the in front of the door. So, so you're saying the terrorist shot through the door, hit him then presumably opened the door and shot him in the head. Yeah. Not only not only opened the door, they went inside, they crossed to the other side of the room and shot him in the head. All of that while the two babies are inside the room. And you can't miss it that there's two babies inside. It's not a big room, it's a small room. So we know that a lot of children and babies were murdered that day. Why were the twins not killed right away with their father? Because they used them, it was very early, right in the beginning of the whole, the whole, this whole massacre. So what we know they did is they left them as bait for 14 hours. 14 hours the terrorists sat in Itai's and Adar's apartment next to two crying babies with no food, no water, no nothing, let them cry in order to, to hurt whoever comes and tries to rescue them. And we know that a lot of people either got murdered or got injured, got shot during this um, 14 hours. For me, this is like the best example of how unhumane these people are. I, I don't even want to call them people because, you know, Put aside the the horrible scenery of what, like, their dead father in the same room with them and and two small babies, but two babies are crying for 14 hours. For me, I can't hear a baby crying for one, two minutes without picking him up or giving something to eat. These terrorists were in this house. They went in and out of the house all the time for 14 hours. Nobody picked up the babies. Nobody gave them something to eat, something to drink. The babies were wet, they were dehydrated, they weren't dressed, they only had diapers on them. What kind of people can, like, who can do this? My understanding is that there were many attempts made to save the two twins, but ultimately it was the 13th Battalion of the Golani Brigade under the command of a man named Tomer Greenberg that managed to save the babies. You mentioned before that you found out they had been saved. Did you know anything about Tomer Greenberg and about the group of soldiers that ended up saving the kids? We know. We were in contact with him. It was a combined force of Golani, 13th, uh, and the Secret Service. The Secret Service guys came to meet us meet and meet the twins and tell their stories. The guys from Golani, Tomer Greenberg and his soldiers, we just spoke with him on the phone. First to thank him and second to um, to know that that what he said, that after everything in Gaza will will finish, is to come and meet us, see the twins. Tomer and Itai knew each other. Really? Yeah. Itai was a commander, an officer in Golani, in the same uh, platoon as Tomer. What they said, what they said also, they, they st- spoke to the family, also Tomer and everybody that was involved in the rescue. 
and they spoke they, they spoke to the family and told the whole rescue story how they couldn't believe their eyes like they came in the house and they saw these two babies they washed their hands because they couldn't bear touching them with whatever they touched before they felt like they need to be so gentle and clean and and like they were shocked so they washed their hands they dressed them with the help of the neighbor they gave them bottles they say each one of them I think drank three bottles three, yeah yeah And they uh, they took them uh, to this armored uh, vehicle and then uh, they say they covered their ears because there's a lot of noise and they said and these are tough men right they said not a single eye in the car stayed dry like they all cried inside they couldn't believe what they just saw what they just did especially Tomer I think he recognized it tie he know exactly whose kids are these kids. Dvir, you said in a recent interview that I watched that you were sure someone in your generation of the six kids would have twins. Why did you say that? This is kind of a thing we used to laugh between our sisters and my and in bar and myself that because my mom's father, my grandfather from my mom's side, he had two uh, pairs of twins in his family. He's the only one who survived. him and uh, uh, one cousin uh, this is the only two people that survived from the winners family so uh, my um, my bet was that it's going to be a doubt really yeah and you're right i was right and to be honest in my point of view she's the only one who could do it Why? so easily Why? and with a smile and keep living She was a superwoman. She was a superwoman. I read somewhere that she gave birth naturally to them, which I kind of could not believe. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. It's so not fair, you know, to think of, we saw her, her and Itai raising these babies. To see them raising them, you know, the first year is so difficult. And we knew how much they wanted these kids and how, how much love and affection these kids had. And they put so much energy in growing them up. So it's so not fair and they did it so well it's so not fair they're not here to grow them up like you look at the twins and you think they they're supposed to be here they're supposed to enjoy all of this it's just not fair it's just who's been taking care of them since October 7th so for the first month they were with the other grandma Itai's mom in the past uh, month month and a half they are with uh, Ophir my sister One of my sisters they're happy they're healthy everyone are everyone around them taking care of them and it's sad because every time you look at them it reminds you a darling tie and how unfair like Maya said how unfair it is but at the same time it fills you up you know it, it gives you this feeling of At least, at least, uh, at least we have them. Mm. At least we have the, the, something that continues what Adar Zenitai meant to us, what all the sacrifice they, they, they made during their life and what made them, what made their death. And all of us as a family were here for them from that day Till we are not going to be here anymore to make sure that they are healthy and smiling and when they get to an older age to make sure that they'll know who their parents are and what they did for them and this is one of the reasons we are here telling their stories you guys spent how many hours all told in the safe room that day we were 24 hours in the safe room the hours went by nobody came and The, it, it, there was still heavy fighting going on around our high house so things were depressing things were really desperate it, 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 the air was hot we it, it was dark no like we said there was no electricity all we had was this small uh, mepi light or like the baby uh, light so you could you couldn't even know like the phone went out at one point that's it we had no phone no communication to the outside world and we just felt like that's it it What can we, like, there's nothing more. Like, we we're going to die in this room. I don't think if we thought we we're going to die, just we thought, like, there's nothing more we can do. What can you do? 
You can't go out because you hear what's going on outside. It's a war zone. You can't contact anyone. They probably think you're dead because you're not responding. What's left to do? So I think at one, around three in the morning, which was already uh, 21 two hours after it all began, we fell asleep. I don't know if we fell asleep or passed out because there was really, there was no air in the room already. They found three of us on the floor. Yeah, we were just on the floor. Lying three of us on the floor. That's how they found us. And we just woke up at around 5.30 in the morning, like this, with soldiers above our head, like with weapons. Weapons in our faces. So we just woke up like that and they said, come, hurry up. You need to pack your stuff. We're going. We said, oh, thank you. Thank you. We thought they were taking us out of the kibbutz. We literally... What was your feeling in that? Were you in shock? Were you crying? What what was the feeling when you looked up and saw the soldier? I think think we were in shock because first, we didn't believe someone will, will come. Second, we either fell asleep or passed out or whatever. So you wake up and you see a, like the weapons in your face. They were like angels, you know. They came to rescue us in hell. It was hell. And again, we didn't sleep for three nights. Yeah. So they told us you need to to pack up uh, real quickly, just stuff for the baby. And then we just picked everything up, put it in like two bags, two plastic bags. We went outside. We held Ziv, our baby. I held our small, stupid dog. One of the soldiers held our big, stupid dog. And we started walking with all these things to the building behind us, which was maybe 30 meters from us, like a one or two minute walk in every day. It took us maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Why? Because they were shooting. They were still shooting. So soldiers kept telling us, Just go down, get down. put us on the, on the ground. And everything is with a baby in your hand. And bullets are still flying around. So there's not actually relief no, because no, you're no, thinking no, you're going to no, be no. shot. The, the fighting in our kibbutz continued till Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon. We were in hell. <laughs> it was hell. Seriously? They took hell. us these 30 meters, basically Crawling. every few steps, they put us on the, on, put us on get the ground down, get down. while they keep shooting, throwing grenades, RPGs, uh, the, the Air Force, everything is around us. To a different house. You feel like you're in a movie. Like To a different house. house. And then we realize that we are 19 people in two bedrooms par- apartment with the soldiers for another four, four hours. plus hours. And the, the terrorists probably realize that they're bringing people to there because instead of taking out one by one, they started to shoot on the building. And the terrorists, the terrorists started to shoot on the building and uh, the so, soldiers were, were afraid that they will shoot like an RPG or something and the building will collapse with all of us inside. So that it was like a huge battle outside. And then only the I soldiers think, went uh, out to fight the terrorists and then uh, we waited a bit longer for some armed, uh, armored uh, cars to come. And on the way out, only then we was saw. the first time we saw that everything we thought or felt or heard while we were in our shelter room is not even close to what really happened outside. What did outside. you see? You saw the pickup, ter- the pickup of the terrorists that came. They came with it from uh, from Gaza. Pickup truck. Pickup yeah. truck, like uh, this white pickup truck, just outside of our house, bombed blown, completely. bombed completely. You saw this car of someone from the from the kibbutz that got the phone call from his daughter that she's dying and he came to rescue her. They shot oh, him. They shot him in the car, like holes all over. The glasses are shattered. Right at the entrance um, to our house. And you saw bodies all over. You saw. You saw like, bodies. On the way I out. I didn't see it. Yeah. I didn't. See and you see, see you look. see, you see, the, like you houses. Look. You see houses burned, like steel fire. Not. Um, not only then, not only then you, there the were smell. bodies. What did and it smell like? Fire. <sighs> back, back then on the way out, it was fire. Mm. Um, when we came back to the kibbutz, like two weeks later, you smell death. death. You smell the blood, you smell, like you, you still saw, two weeks later, and you still saw exactly what happened where. Even our house that didn't have any blood in it was smelled like death. One turn of the story that I, I really couldn't imagine, you have the coincidence, or maybe it's more than that, of twins in your family and then the twins surviving, is that the twins recently turned one. And on the day of their birthday, 
Tomer Greenberg, the commander that rescued them, fell in battle in Gaza. Is that right? saying that and it gives me the chills. Yeah. Yeah, Tomer and his soldiers gave them their second chance, rescued them, and fell in the same date that we and Guy um, had their one-year birthday. And Tomer himself have family, kids. And... Uh, It's hard. The funeral was two days ago. My family went there. And it's hard. People who know about Israel, even a little bit, know that, you know, in America we're a country of 330 million, a very small number of people serve in the military. You can go your whole life living in certain places and not know anyone that serves. And Israel is a tiny country of how many million people? Nine, I think. Nine, nine, eight or nine million people. There's a universal draft. Everyone serves in the military. Everybody knows somebody. And there's an expectation that, you know, everyone sacrifices for the sake of the country. But the amount of the sacrifice, it almost seems like a euphemism, the amount of young people that have been lost in since October 7th, both civilians like Hadar and Itai, hostages, kidnapped people, young women, but then also people like Tomer Greenberg. It just seems, from the outside looking in, like it's almost too much to bear. It is. It is. We, we lost, um, as a kibbutz, as a community, we lost, uh, that day we lost 63 people. Um, just in my close family, it's Adar, Itai, and Yav, my cousin. How did he die? Also, he held the window um, and gave the chance to Shaili, his wife, and Shaya, the one-month daughter, to run away and got shot, got married. He and died also, saving his, his wife and his, kids. Yeah. And also his little girl would grow up without knowing her father. And uh, all the guys from the first response unit or all the people, other people, it's like 63 people that you know each and every one of them. You Died. grew up with them. Childhood murdered. friends, murdered, yeah. Uh, parents, cousins, uncles, daughters, grandfathers. And we also had uh, 18 uh, kidnapped people. From your kibbutz. From my kibbutz. This is only for my kibbutz. The numbers are much, much, much bigger all around, including the Nova Festival. And as someone that lived, born there, I know personally hundreds, hundreds. I remember talking to Maya the, in the first few days, and said, I, I know, I know most of the of the faces. I know them. I grew up with them. It's not like one or two or three or four or five or 60 or 100 or 150. It's like hundreds. From, my, from our kibbutz, out of the 18, 11 came back. And unfortunately, uh, two days ago, I think it was two days ago, uh, two of the, of the seven people that were still... Uh, held the hostages there in Gaza, died. So now we have 65 uh, murdered people from my kibbutz. We, still, five, we still have five that are still there. We Men still have 129 in, in total. Five of them are from, from our kibbutz. So some of the stories are being, it's obviously an extraordinarily sensitive subject because family is in, of course, the government of Israel doesn't want, wants the greatest possible chance of them to be released and unharmed. But some of the, some of the people that have been released have given interviews talking about really horrible conditions in some cases, some of them talking about other, other hostages they've encountered who have talked about sexual abuse. I'm wondering 
what you've heard of, what the public conversation is like in Israel. Okay, so first thing you need to understand, I don't like to call them hostages because hostage is a soldier that was taken in battle and is being held by the enemy. These are not soldiers. These are civilians who are in their homes, in their beds. Just someone came and forced it, took them from their homes. Uh, so they're not hostages, they're kidnapped people. Uh, these people have no Red Cross visits. They don't get their medicine. Some of them are chronically ill. Some of them need medicine. No one knows what's going on with them. Their family has no clue of where they're at, what condition are. They don't even know if they're dead or alive. The only things we know are from videos that, uh, that, uh, that, were, that were seen or were taken by Hamas themselves and by uh, things that um, people who came back are saying. Um, we've heard horrible stories about what's going on there to men and to women. Very, very uh, troubling stories, very scary stories. We do, we do know uh, there were a few deals to release the hostages, the, the ones that got out. And the last deal was supposed to be a deal of uh, young women that were supposed to go out. And at the last minute, Hamas broke the deal and didn't want to go through with that. And we are very worried, why didn't the deal went through? Why, why won't they release these women? Um, and what's your sense of why? I don't even dare to say. I don't, I don't even dare to say. The whole time I'm trying not to think what's going on with them. I just hope they're okay, physically and mentally okay. I just hope they will come back here and that they will be safe. And I just know that they need to come back now. They can't wait. Not a day, not two days, not a week. They need to come back now. That's the main goal. That's also the purpose that we're here. We want to say by any means that these people need to come out. It's crazy for us that people are starting to say this didn't happen or Israeli made it or Israelis are exaggerating. I wish it, it didn't happen. I wish we were exaggerating. I wish this was all just made up. But we came here to say that this happened and we saw it and we were there and we felt it and all the world needs to know that this happened. And my house, the, like I can still smell the smell of the fire from the house behind my house burning. I can still feel the fear when we got the message uh, from uh, one of the uh, people in the kibbutz. He said, well, they're burning their house. If, you, if, if they're burning your house, stay inside. It's better to get burned than to be caught by Hamas. And we were, like, I can still feel... Or, 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 I can be, still feel or be ready that the Air Force are going to yeah. bomb in the kibbutz, so stay in the shelters. No, or. but like, what I want to say, I can still feel the fear of, are they going to burn my, the house on me? I, like, I, I'm sitting on, on, on my safe room floor with my baby. The room is hot. And I'm just touching the floor to feel, is it hot? Because if they're going to burn the house, will I know everything is already burning? The, the, the whole place smelled like fire all the time. So how will I know that they're burning the house? And if they will burn, like you, you're trying to figure out, what am I going to do? If they're going to burn the house, so will I go out the window? But then they will be waiting for me outside the window. So what will I do? So, so I wish all of that didn't happen. Like I wish all of our friends, all of our family were still here with us. I wish we were still in our home because you need to understand we're not in our homes for over two months. We can't go back to the kibbutz. I don't know when we will be able to go back to the kibbutz. We're basically refugees in our own country. We have not nothing like the clothes. You, well, this is, of course, but the clothes we're wearing is stuff that people got us, brought us. It's not our stuff. It's not our clothes. So I wish everything didn't happen. No, it happened. So this is what we came to say. And I think the most important thing we came to say is that we have hostages there. Until the hostages aren't coming back, no one can go on with their lives. These people have done nothing wrong. They're plain civilians. They need to be back home. And all the international organizations, all the governments, Everyone in the world need to focus now on getting these civilians back because this is the worst war crime that's ever been committed. Since the Holocaust. The, these people need to be back home. And, and that's it. That's the most important thing. We, we don't care about anything else, really. There's a poll that came out over the weekend that has a lot of shocking figures, okay? It's all about kids 
young Americans between the ages of 18 and 24. I'm going to spare you a lot of them, but I wanted to share one with you. The poll found, it's a Harvard-Harris poll, that 60% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 said that the attack of October 7th can be justified by Palestinian grievances. What do you I say think, to that? I think... I want to put anti-Semitism aside because I'd rather not think about that because if someone is anti-Semitic, if someone is racist, there's nothing I can do about it. All the, from the river to the sea and stuff. I have nothing to do with the, with the racist people. I think what people don't understand is that the, bigger, the biggest victim of, from Hamas are the Palestinian people. You need to understand that in the past few years, Israel gave Palestinians from Gaza a more work permit. They used to come into Israel and work. Israel sent money to Gaza to send the money so that they can build Gaza. We live three kilometers from the border. So we see the trucks going in. We see the, mater the materials for building, the medicine, the food. Everything went in from Israel to help them build Gaza. What did they do? Build the October 7, build the tunnels. We're dealing with a terror organization that deprives their own people. They're using their people as a human shield. They're shooting missiles from hospitals, from schools. Even now, by the way, you see on the news and everywhere that they rob the, the trucks that, you know, the humanitarian trucks. The humanitarian aid. Send them food, send them medicines, where it goes. Now, what I suggest, what I suggest these people to open their news, don't just, don't just repeat what you hear. Try to find authentic voices from Gaza, because now when Hamas is starting to be a bit weaker, you start to hear the real voices from Gaza and people are starting to talk. And what they're saying, they don't blame Israel. They're blaming Sinwar and they're blaming Hamas. And they say Hamas has destroyed Gaza. It brought them back years, years and Decades years back. back. I think like the, 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 I want to believe that the common person in Gaza is like me. He wants peace. He wants to, at the end of the day, go home to his kids. He doesn't want to have missiles around him. He doesn't want to be in a war zone. He just wants to live and to provide his family. Do you still believe that after October 7th? Yes. You do? It's hard. It's hard because I've seen the videos of the... You see the videos of the people, uh, you know, cheering and um, and torturing bodies and not Look, bodies it's, and living it's people. It's going to take at least a generation. If 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 you want to change something, it's it takes a generation till you know something started to 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 change. Um, and those kids, those sixteen, eighteen, twenty, the age ages, I'm talking. Um, doesn't know anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. Since they were kids, that's what they teach them. That's what they show them. Um, this is how they live. So, if you talk to the elderly from Gaza, you'll hear that they they had a, a different life. We, they remember we, the life when your family exactly, used to go visit the beach. Exactly, and they worked and and lived and ate in the dining room in the kibbutz with us. It's it's a hard it's really it's hard because it's very hard to believe that in these days but I think if we want to look forward we have to believe that because Gaza will be Gaza Israel will be Israel we're going to stay neighbors and I think the only the only way we can stay neighbors the only way we have because no, none of us is going to disappear all of a sudden so I think we must believe that at the end we all want peace and we can all live together and we have to believe that this can happen. But in order for that to happen, we, we can't deal with the terror organization. They, 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 they need to, if you want to free Gaza, free them from Hamas. Free them from Hamas, free them from terror. Let the Palestinian people have a decent, a, a decent leaders, people who will lead them towards peace and not towards war, people who will use the money to build Gaza and not to, 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 to pay for a war. The, the leaders of the Hamas have billions of dollars. None of them or their family, none of their families lives in Gaza. Before October 7th, 
It was mostly paradise. Can you ever imagine going back to Kfaraza to live? I think it's a hard question for 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 now because, like Maya said, till we won't get those friends, members, people we know that got kidnapped, no one can even think of of continuing in his life. And till we know what's gonna be in Gaza and where it goes. You can't even think of yes, no, maybe, why not, why yes. Like, it's it's not even something that you know go through. It it doesn't even get in because think of what you you don't know what what is going on with your people. You don't know where you're going back to. How long it's going to take to rebuild Kfaza? Is there any thought in your mind to think? Maybe Israel's not the place to raise a family? No. Why? First, uh, because now when you do hear or open the news, just, you know, here and there, you see that it's all over, all over the world. What is? The Hatred of Jews? Yeah. Being, being Jewish all over the world, it is, is, is crazy. Although we are big communities everywhere. And second, um, our families, our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, like now after this, it's, I think that in general to leave, leave where, you, where you, you leave your family and go somewhere else, it's hard. And now after what happened, it's even harder. And I don't think that none of us can even think of, you know, leaving everything behind. Israel is the only Jewish state. The twins are only a year old now. They're not going to remember their parents. What are you going to tell them about who they were and about what happened that day? I think that uh, they'll know exactly who their parents were, uh, the kind of people, the kind of parent, um, the bravery, the um, And again, this is one of the reasons we are um, we are going around and telling their story, and it's important for us uh, so that other people will will know who Atari Dai and Adar and Itai um, were. And I think we will we'll just keep all the videos, all the articles, and where they'll be old enough to face. The story face the facts, uh, they will watch it, they will read it. But till then, um, what is what's important is to take care of them, to make sure they're happy. But I don't think that you can run away from it. Not in, in general of what of what happened that day to thousands of people, hundreds of families. Um, so what we can... Um, I would say control as family is is to feed them slowly slowly uh, with what's important to that to the, to this certain point. My aunt Vir, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank, thank you, you for having much. us. Thanks for listening. If you were moved by this conversation and I haven't stopped thinking about it, please share it with your friends and family. And as always, if you want to support these kind of conversations and the journalism that we do here on Honestly and at the Free Press, please go to thefp.com and become a subscriber today. We'll see you next time.